Welcome back from your shortened spring breaks, during which, as you know, absolutely nothing of note happened in the news at all whatsoever. Um, on a related note, you may also have noticed that the outside world no longer exists, and all learning is now done like this, online. So, here we are, day one of our online version of our class that used to be a non-online class. In case you don't remember me, I'm your instructor. Um, what we're going to be doing for the next few weeks at least, and we're basically all being told for the rest of the semester, we got a plan on it being the rest of the semester, is this. So I'm going to be doing video lectures for every class period, and then I'm going to be posting quizzes, very short, very easy quizzes, about those lectures onto D2L and you're going to do them and those are going to take the place of the pop-up um, I just knocked into the computer I, I, I was shaking there I'm so nervous to do stuff on camera right those will take place of the pop-up participation portion of the grade it's going to be easy points uh, though some of the questions will be substantive you're going to have unlimited attempts and they're basically there to make sure that you're watching and to make sure that you're actually showing up for every class. Uh, every video after this one though is going to be a little different. We're not diving into the content yet. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. We're all uh, just oriented to this new way of doing things. So we're not going to be very content heavy today. We're going to get back into the content in the next class period, the next video or sequence of videos, um, which is the next thing I'm going to cover. But today we're just getting on the same page. Um, another thing that's going to happen for pretty much all the rest of the videos in this class, you're not going to be seeing this. You're going to be seeing a PowerPoint presentation and hearing my soothing, relaxing, annoying, whatever your opinion is of it voice, describing what we're seeing and what you need to know about it. And then there will be quizzes on that. And there will also be, um, we're for a lot of these classes, probably all of them, we're going to have multiple videos. I'm going to try to make sure they're not longer than 15 minutes. Most of what we cover in the lectures, they can be broken down into different parts, and I'll just do short videos on each of the parts, bite-sized chunks, easier to process and digest, and if you don't want to sit down for an entire hour or so watching everything, you don't. You just watch the little 10-ish to 15 minute videos and do other things during the day and then come back to watch another video and so on. And uh, then when you're done watching all of them, you can re-watch them as many times as you want, obviously, and answer the quizzes and stop the quiz and watch the video. The quizzes are in time, but they do have due dates. You do need to get them done uh, by the end of the night in order to get credit by midnight in order to get credit for being in class on that day, get the pop-up grade, etc. So uh, you should be able to wake up to these videos at the beginning of the day and uh, the quiz is ready for you and you have all day to do it. So we're not going to be meeting during normal class time uh, because we understand that everything is so different. You may have to share devices with other people, so you may not have access to those devices during class time. So it's a completely online format now. Um, everything else is going to be the same, uh, except the exams are going to be moved online, as long as we have an exam before campus reopens, which again, we're moving forward expect uh, expecting that it won't reopen. So they'll all be under the quizzes tab of D2L. So, uh, I think that's it as far as the logistics are concerned. So, today's topic isn't something you're going to be quizzed on. Well, you're going to be quizzed on to make sure that you watch the video, but you don't really need to remember all of this. It's just, uh, it, it's not going to be on the exam. That's what I mean. It's just a lot of people ask me, you know, you tell people you're an economist, some of the same questions come up. I've already had students ask me what I think about the economics of coronavirus. So the topic of this video is the economics of coronavirus, at least 
as far as I can tell, there's really not anything anybody really knows. There, there isn't anything any economist knows yet. Uh, we know that we're in a recession, obviously, and this recession is bad. But bad can mean a lot of different things. It's numerically bad. We've seen some projections that we're going to see a 50% contraction in GDP, which is enormous. Um, it's definitely one that guys like me are going to be lecturing on or covering 50 years in the future. There's this one really interesting part of American history where we pretty much deliberately shut the economy down and saw this massive contraction in GDP. Now, again, we don't know how big that's going to be uh, because, again, these, uh, these, these, these data come in on a lag. So anytime you see GDP statistics, you're seeing what GDP was in the past when it was estimated. Same thing with unemployment. We're not going to know what unemployment was until actually this coming Friday, the first Friday of the month. And that's still only going to cover part of the picture. It's going to be unemployment for the entire month of March, but it was the latter half of March during which we had a shutdown. So we might, it might be that the first Friday of May is going to be the more illuminating unemployment data. Either way, I've seen projections where we're going to have that 50% contraction and unemployment will rise to 30%. But remember, these are just projections. A lot of what we're seeing that's presented as data that we just know that this has happened, you got to read the fine print a little bit. A lot of them are projections. They're based on models. They're based, they're educated guesses. That, that, that doesn't mean that they're going to be wrong, but it means that they're the best guess that we have right now. So an interesting thing about unemployment, it's, um, well, as hopefully a lot of you know, unemployment is not just based on whether someone has a job or not, it's based on whether people are looking. A lot of people who lost their jobs might not be actively looking right now because they don't, they don't think they can find anything because nobody's hiring presently. Although there are some people who are hiring for uh, delivery services and such, but a lot of people are going to think that for their skill set, nobody's hiring. So we might see U3 unemployment numbers, the official unemployment number, sitting at surprisingly low levels, while some of the later numbers that capture underemployment or um, discouraged workers, the U4, 5, and U6 numbers, those might be a little elevated. So we'll have to wait and see, and it'll be interesting to see. But this is also the short run. Uh, ben Bernanke, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, who was the chairman of the Fed the last time we had such gigantic interventions by the Federal Reserve, um, he recently came out and said, this, this isn't like a financial crisis. This is more like a natural disaster. Natural disasters will have sharp effects on GDP, unemployment, etc. And then there will be a quick recovery. Once you know people put the pieces back together, life tends to go on and things can return to normalcy rather quickly. And this is why you hear a lot of doom and gloom from economists, and you pretty much always do. Uh, but there is some optimism out there, too, which is actually kind of rare for economists. I, I think I've pointed this out, too, that the incentives for economists favor being very negative. If, you're, if you get positive projections and then bad things happen, people kind of, they're grouchy with you, and you also lose a little credibility for being too much of a Pollyanna. It's more useful to be able to warn us of danger coming than it is to be able to warn us of sunshine and happiness, right? So you tend to find that economists are always out there predicting recessions, and they'll cover themselves saying in the next oh, two years or so, there's going to be a recession. The longer out you go, the more likely it is that you're going to have a recession. And recessions are going to happen. We have a business cycle, as many of you may recall. Uh, economy goes up, and then it goes down for a bit, and then it goes up again. 
So predicting that we're going to have a recession in the next couple of years is not exactly an impressive thing, but economists are covering their tracks. So if a recession doesn't happen in the time period in which an economist predicts a recession will happen, then, hey, it's, hey we're, aren't, aren't we happy that I was wrong? But the theory was sound, right? Remember, we always have that little out as economists. Uh, predicting the future is always impossible, so you can always say there are a lot of things that couldn't have been predicted. So... Uh, the, it, someone who comes to mind because of all of this is a uh, name, for some reason I'm blanking on it, but I wrote it down in my notes here. Uh, he came up during the financial crisis. I'm not saying, oh, Hyman Minsky. Uh, he came up during the financial crisis as a way of explaining it as a secular event. He was the guy who broke down investors into different classes. There are those investors who are good for the economy, who are investing in productive things, and those investors who are a bit more speculative. And I'm oversimplifying big time here, but they can pretty much put the economy on very in a very shaky place and set the stage for large collapses. And he came to prominence after the 2008 financial crisis. But I remember reading about him that uh, he was made fun of for having successfully predicted two of the last seven recessions. And, you know, poor Hyman Minsky gets picked on for that. But that's that's a lot of economists. They predict recession after recession after recession. And when a recession happens, they can say they're right. When it doesn't happen, they can just kind of say, hey, the economy's doing great right now. Aren't we all happy? And nobody remembers that they predicted a recession. You look back at the last hundred years of economic history, you see huge economic collapses and events that really nobody predicted. There are always a few lonely voices, especially people after the fact are, come out, are gonna come out and say, hey, I predicted this, but as far as the specific mechanisms that brought us to these, to the Great Depression, to the oil shocks of the 70s, the savings and loan crisis of the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, uh, the financial crisis of 2008, very, very, very few economists actually predicted those collapses. In the meantime, as far as economic growth is concerned, very few people predicted the growth of the 50s, very few people predicted the 60s, very few people predicted the 80s, very few people predicted the 90s, the mid-2000s, the last few years, because, again, the incentives favor doom and gloom instead of positivity. It's pretty much only politicians who stand to benefit from people thinking, hey, if we vote for you, then we're going to have growth. They're pretty much the only ones who say, who can say, see, I told you so. But even then, they may not deserve much credit, whether we're talking about Eisenhower in the 50s, Clinton in the 90s. Maybe they deserve credit. Maybe they didn't. That's a different video. But they're pretty much the only ones who you can go back and say, hey, vote for me and things will be great. Other than that, there really isn't anybody predicting growth. And there isn't anybody who's precisely predicting recessions, but there are a lot of recessions being predicted every day by economists over the years. So a lot of the negativity you're going to see in the news or already have, some of those predictions may be spot on. They may not be. We'll have to wait and see. But take it all with a grain of salt. That's the main thing I'm saying here. There are reasons for optimism. Uh, some of these predict predictions are based on, well, actually, there's, there's one interesting story I read that was likening this to the 2008 financial crisis, trying to make it into a financial crisis by pointing at mortgage servicers. They're the ones who collect payments from people who took out loans and pay them to the banks. They're kind of a middleman that uh, takes collection activities off of the bank's shoulders, and they're supposed to have the money in hand to give to the banks, and they're not going to. But they're not lenders. The key to why the Great Depression and the 2008 financial crisis had such slow recoveries is because the lenders, the financial institutions, were very badly hit by those crises and took a long time not just to recover but to be confident enough to start lending again. Mortgage services are, are not the lenders. And one would think that banks are going to want to maintain their relationships with their servicers so they're not going to squeeze them for money that they don't have. They're going to understand these are unique circumstances. So I get the logic of that article, but I'm not sure that I'm quite on board with the, hey, we've got 10 years of 
econ of an economic mess coming ahead of us. So some of the optimism comes from you've probably seen some of the headlines about the Federal Reserve injecting a tremendous amount of liquidity into the financial system in addition to the quote Main Street bailouts that um, I mean we all know that most of us are getting a check a pretty nice one. So you're going to have a lot of money built up on the demand side and a lot of liquidity on the supply side. They tried to do this after the 2008 crisis and we continued to have economic stagnation. The money just didn't seem to go much of anywhere. They didn't do it exactly this way. And again, that was a financial, a real legitimate financial crisis whose origins were in the financial sector. This is an economy where pretty much all the fundamentals by all measurements, were really strong before we pretty much chose consciously to shut things down. So once things can open back up, the, we have an economy that had strong fundamentals. Steps were taken to keep people in sort of a holding pattern instead of going away, though some businesses probably will shut their doors permanently. But new businesses will have an incentive to open up to take their place, and there's going to be a financial institution sitting on a lot of cash that they don't want to sit on. They're going to want to lend it out and they're going to see a potentially healthy economic circumstance waiting to receive those loans. So when you have solid fundamentals and you add on to that a lot of liquidity, both on the consumer side and in financial institutions, those are the makings of an economic boom. And that actually is typically what happens. In the, his, in the last hundred years of the economy, actually going back more than a hundred years, we see recessions that are followed by recoveries that are just as large and just as fast. There's a lot of symmetry to collapses and recoveries, except that the recoveries tend to continue for longer than the recessions do, which is why economies just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's a good thing for all of us. The Great Depression and financial crisis of 2008 were two big exceptions to that symmetry. There was a huge collapse that happened suddenly and a very slow, long, protracted recovery. And both were centered in a financial system that saw massive amounts of value vanish and vanish permanently. And a lot of banks closed down. That's not what we're seeing right now. So we could very well see... A pretty big economic boom that's going to snap us right back to where we were thanks to a lot of the steps that were taken, the liquidity in the banking system, etc. There are some concerns about those steps, though. We're going into debt big time to pay for all of this on the fiscal policy side. On the monetary policy side, the Federal Reserve is injecting a lot of liquidity into banks that's Remember the equation of exchange, M times V equals P times Y. Money times the velocity of money, the number of times it's exchanged, has to equal the price level times output. And if the P part of the, or the M part of that equation goes up, but Y isn't rising since V is fixed, P goes up and you have massive inflation. Um, so the Fed might be causing a lot of inflation. Those are some concerns that are out there. And then we already had a huge deficit. So we're straining the deficit by that much more. Are we going to end up in a debt crisis? Maybe. Again, we don't know what's going to happen. But there are a couple of things to point out here. First of all, the debt to GDP ratio is higher than it typically should be. It's higher than it usually is historically. It's still not higher than it's ever been. It's not higher than it's been in other places that have had perpetually high debt but still haven't had debt crises. Debt crises mean you can't pay your bills. You're going to default. We're nowhere close to that. We still bring in way more money than we need to spend to pay down our debt every day. So it's not to say we're not heading to one eventually, but eventually still seems to be a pretty good ways off if it's ever going to happen. As far as the inflation happening for the Federal Reserve injecting a lot of liquidity into the banking system, the banking system has to put that money out there for the M part to truly rise. M0 base money rises when that happens. But V ends up going down because the average dollar isn't being traded. It's not going to go out in the system in a way that's going to cause P to rise until banks believe that there are loans to finance. But when they do that, the Y part goes up. So the P part doesn't have the P part. Listen to that. 
the price level doesn't have to rise mathematically because output is rising. And the V part, the, the velocity of money, is declining as a lot of that base money stays in banks until the output part rises. That's why inflation didn't happen the last time when we had quantitative easing after the financial crisis. That's why we might not see inflation this time. So I know a lot of that was a little, a little out of left field, maybe beyond what, certainly beyond what we've covered in some cases. Um, but like I said, I'm not testing you on any of this. The, these are just some of the different perspectives as well as kind of my take on all of this. I tend to be a bit Pollyannish as it is, and I've made incorrect predictions based on my over-optimism. Uh, ask my dad how often I've been wrong about how the Broncos season is going to go because I tend to be really optimistic all the time, right? I err on the side of optimism, which economists aren't supposed to do. We're supposed to be very pessimistic and negative. But there is plenty of reason for optimism here, and there are more economists out there than I'm used to seeing who are saying, again, Ben Bernanke, he's not part of any political apparatus that stands to benefit from us having optimism. And he's out there trying to trying to remind us that this, as, as much as everyone wants to take everything and make it, this is the next 2008, everyone wants to call the next one. There are too many things that are different here, and they're important things. So when you have a lot of economists who are optimistic, that's something unusual. So um, hope you guys have stayed healthy and enjoyed the break. And the, starting with the next video, we're going to get back into content. Do go over to the quiz section to D2L now, though. Take the quiz and then take it again and again and again. Don't accept less than 10%. You get unlimited attempts. It's a way of taking attendance to make sure that you guys are, are back and are tracking things and you get easy points for your grade. So take the quiz and next class period we'll have another video and another quiz. So good to see you guys again. Uh, take care.